Thank you for coming to tonight's online speakeasy. Um, these events are usually members only, where we're joined in conversation by a, a special guest. But we've also opened up tonight's event to the public. So welcome to those of you who are joining and are not yet uh, members of the Free Speech Union. If you go to freespeechunion.org, you can find out a lot more about us and about the kind of events that we hold. So uh, we're delighted to be have been asked to host the UK launch of Ab Abigail Schreier's new book, uh, Bad Therapy, Why the Kids Aren't Growing Up. Uh, you may have noticed that Abigail's received a considerable amount of press this last week, uh, both in the UK press and uh, in America, um, and just uh, lots of very, very positive reviews where people are, are really um, engaging with the substance of Abigail's argument. And now Abigail is a writer for the Wall Street Journal. She's got degrees from Columbia College, uh, New York and the University of Oxford and uh, Yale Law School. Uh, but the reason you probably heard of her is um, that Abigail's first book, Irreversible Damage, which I'm now going to wave as well. Um, this is the US version with the title, subtitle Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters. You may have read the UK version, which was called Irreversible Damage, Teenage Girls and the Transgender Craze, um, and will have found its analysis of the explosion of gender questioning amongst adolescent girls profoundly insightful and certainly has become a real reference point for the discussion that's taking place over here. Um, on publication, the book became the focus of, of cancellation campaigns by trans activists, something very familiar to us, um, and resulting in its temporary withdrawal from Target stores in the US uh, to resistance to its promotion by staff at Amazon and Spotify, and uh, even demands that it will be burned, <laughs> which is putting it on the extreme end of things. Um, and even now, when that's all settled down somewhat, I think, um, publishers undertaking foreign language translations of the book are under pressure to abandon the project. Um, I, the latest one I saw was uh, in Japan. Abigail can talk to us about that if she wants to later on. So it's a fascinating um, phenomenon, really. That's why we're interested in the book in particular as the Free Speech Union, because this book, the first book, has become a, a kind of free speech cause celebre. Uh, and the new book is kind of continuing uh, Abigail's commitment to exploring new taboos and in particular where young people are concerned. Uh, so in her new book, uh, she expands the lens from the, the trans phenomenon to the sort of younger generation as a whole, uh, not just those caught up in, in the kind of trans craze, as she's put it. Uh, and she's asking in the new book whether the therapeutic approach towards the raising of children, which has been adopted in the past 20 years or so, has, has done more harm than good to young people's mental health. Um, Esther will put a link for you to buy, well, she's already put a link for you to buy the book in the chat. Um, and uh, so Abigail and I are going to have a conversation for the first kind of 40, 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll open up uh, to the Q&A. You can post in there at any point uh, and we'll I'll put those questions to Abigail myself just to sort of save time and to make sure we can get a really slick video ed edit out really quickly. Um, but do feel free to, to put your questions in and, and your comments as well into the Q&A and I'll put them to Abigail later on. Best not to put them in the chat because they'll get lost um, in there. So. Um, Hi, Abigail. Thanks. Hi. It's Thanks great, so it's much really for joining great us. To be here. I, it's, it's great to talk to you. I, I, you can imagine I love talking to British audiences, uh, where, which, which always seems so much more reasonable than in the United States. But uh, uh, thank you so much for having me. I really do appreciate well, it. Well, you've been lucky if you've got that impression. I'm sure a lot of people would say <laughs> we've also got our madnesses going on as well. Um, so I wanted to ask you, first of all, uh, I mean, obviously the book is called Bad Therapy. I mean, what to you is therapy? What is it that you're talking about? What's the phen phenomenon that you're trying to describe here? Sure. So when I say bad therapy, I'm referring to unnecessary therapy that either introduces new symptoms or makes existing symptoms worse. And, you know, I, I offer a definition of therapy in the book. It's not terribly good because... Um, I use the definition propounded by the uh, American Psychological Association and other therapeutic professional organizations, and the circulation and the definitions are invariably circular, meaning they say things like anything that happens between a therapist and a patient uh, is therapy, um, effectively. Um, so, you know, there's a problem in the profession, which is that anything seems to count as therapy today. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that all therapy is bad therapy. But there's a lot of bad therapy going on, and uh, and, and that's what it is. 
And do you think uh, so? Th- there seems to be the relate the phenomenon of there just being this proliferation of therapists, and though more and more of those relationships taking place where individual children may have a therapist as well as a family and as well as a school. Um, but is there also something broader there about a kind of more a sort of culture that talks about uh, uses a therapeutic language? That's right. What what I say in the book is that therapy has basically been and what I call bad therapy, meaning the kind that exacerbates existing symptoms and makes um, and introduces new ones, um, is being crop dusted across America for sure, and to a large extent the West. Um, in schools, you'll find all kinds of therapeutic interventions. And um, parents no longer feel confident being parents of this sort of traditional vein. They are largely taking their cue from therapists as to how they should behave. And they've been doing this for over a generation. So these kids effectively were raising a generation of shrinks kids. They've had that much therapy. And, and you're seeing it reflected in the level of you know, diagnosis, uh, various psychiatric medications they're on. Um, it's, it's just been going up and up and up while um, while the incidence of mental health problem is also going up. So in other words, sorry, not only are rates of diagnoses going up, but people claiming to suffer um, is going up and up while we should, while we're getting them, while we have the most pervasive, most accessible treatment. So that's that's sort of the paradox, right? When you have more treatment, you should see the in- incidence rate, the point prevalence rate of, an, of a malady or, or a disorder going down, but we're seeing it go rise all across the West with increased intervention. And do you think it's only now possible to see that? I mean, what you've got in the book is an awful lot of evidence, which now seems to be available to show that there is a harmful effect um, from these interventions. Is that only the case now, do you think? Is it only now become evident? It's a good question. You know, I think people could have seen it earlier. Um, I think that there were earlier books on the, um, wonderful books on the iatrogenic effects of therapy one I believe was called by Robert Whitaker, um, A History of an Epidemic, brilliant book by a, a wonderful science journalist. And it was about the all the harms one can see from therapy. But I don't think the 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 pervasiveness he was writing about, you know, what we were seeing in, in part in children, but and he talked about the harms therapy can cause, but I don't think it was as pervasive. Therapy wasn't as pervasive as it is today. So I think a lot of things he once pointed out have gotten much, much worse. And especially because they're so uh, routinely introduced in schools now, including in your schools in the UK. Yes, I think that's where, uh, because I I was thinking as I was reading the book that I can remember like 25 years ago, if you talked about therapy in Britain, you were really laughing at Woody Allen. Right. It was a kind of a, a it was an American a phenomenon and it was a neurotic phenomenon, not not of the normal American. It right. was a it was a joke. I mean, that was the joke of many Woody Allen films. And that just to refer to my therapist was clearly a sort of, you know, a funny thing to say, not a, a reasonable thing to say. Um, and then it became, I suppose, associated with kind of California. And now it's both coasts, I suppose. And then right. actually now in Britain. Even if people don't necessarily call it therapy and they wouldn't necessarily recognize every person having a therapist, it's certainly become an awful lot more common amongst a certain class of people. And the commentary app will refer to having very, very regular therapy. Lots of journalists will talk about it. And and I think, you know, when I did the investigation into the schools in the U.S., I think what parents aren't aware or may, may not have realized is that this is therapy what's going on in schools are therapeutic techniques and they come with the same harms that therapy can cause like increased anxiety like increased depression like um you know constant rumination on your pain and alienation from loved ones all these things are what they call iatrogenic effects of therapy where the where the treatment introduces the harm and um, I, I think that's what we're seeing in this population, whether it's young kids t- referring to their PTSD because they, you know, felt teased in middle school or their trauma. You, you convinced an entire generation that even the routine incidents of life constitute terrible trauma and forever damage them. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I'll just mention one thing really quickly. When, when, I, when I wrote the book, I said, wow, we're getting, I became aware there's a lot of therapy going on with these kids in various forms, including in the schools. And um, I I also looked into here are the 
uh, effects, the iatrogenic effects of therapy, the negative effects we would accept, we would expect to see in the population. And look, I point out, we are seeing those effects, but I didn't yet have a study that showed that if you do this in schools, you will produce the, the effects on those school children. But I wasn't the only one with that idea. While I was working on the book, there were researchers in England and Australia who apparently were thinking the exact same. And one of them is a wonderful British, um, I, I've never met her, but a, a researcher named Folks out of Oxford who looked at 8,000 British teens. The, the, the research came out, I had already turned in the book, but um, 8,000 British teens, and they looked at the anti-bullying techniques children were given. These are psychological techniques and mindfulness techniques. And she was able to show that it made children sadder, um, more depressed, more anxious, and more alienated from their parents. It is. Uh, I mean, it's it's very frustrating, really, because it people were warning about this a, a really long time ago. I mean, colleagues of mine when I was in academia were making the arguments that the harms of anti-bullying campaigns, where you you increase the reliance of children on the adults in their lives yes. rather than letting them get on with you know, working out the difficulties of conflict in children's relationships. You encourage the kind of tattletale culture, yeah. which you talk about in the book. Um, you just diminish resilience. Um, and it's, it, I remember at the time, it was always greeted as this kind of heartless argument. And the same way if you argued against counselling or, you know, the kind of prevalence of therapy, it was always seen as the kind of un, the unkind um, response and and problematizing it was seen as being somehow you were trying to hold on to a stiff upper lip. Right. Uh, Isn't that what they always do, though? You, you bring up a, a valid concern that some, you know, that in the population that is getting preventive mental health, not the not the population that desperately needs it, but preventive mental health care, that we're seeing these effects like the one you just mentioned, which is so important, I forgot to mention, treatment dependency or over-reliance on adults to solve problems for you. This is so bad for kids. Um, now, not if they really need it, of course. Not if a child's anorexic, you don't not take her for treatment. It's it's so obvious. But 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 if they don't need it, see, I'm I I guess one way of looking at my book is it's a it's a call to reset the default. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that no child ever gets an antidepressant and no child is ever taken to therapy. Of course, there are children who desperately need these things. But should the default assumption be, oh, you have a problem, why don't you go talk to a therapist? No, nor should you talk to a teacher playing therapist because both of those are going to introduce all kinds of other problems. And do you think, I, I mean, I, I, when my children were finishing their days at primary school, so up to the age of about 10, it was noticeable that there were more and more staff appearing in the, in the school who were not teachers. Uh, so liaison officers of various types, um, counsel, family counsellors, and they were sort of always floating around, you know, quite sure what they did. Um, but at the same time, they, there was a sense of surveillance of parents going on there. Is that, is that similar to what's happened in the States or have teachers absolutely. now become the therapists? That's absolutely right. Our counselling departments have exploded. And the problem is they're treating the well in addition to the um, sick. I mean, you know, the study I mentioned earlier by folks, one of the things that she hypothesizes and her team hypothesizes is a reason that these kids ended up sadder after these mental health interventions is because just the act of labeling yourself, getting a diagnosis, thinking of yourself as, as having anxiety, labeling your anxiety, that that alone is a, it can be a harm, right? In someone who doesn't already have a problem, now you've introduced a problem and a limitation. Mm -hmm. And th that's the reason. We're, one of the most troubling things we're seeing in the rising generation is a feeling of inefficacy. They feel they can't do anything to improve their circumstances of their lives. They feel powerless. And that's exactly what we would expect to see in an overtreated population. Mm. They feel they have to go to an adult expert and confer before they make any decision in their lives. Do you think, well, and one of the other criticisms that was always put to people that were trying to raise the problem of, of therapy culture was um, 
that somehow you wanted to just go back to the past. <laughs> you just wanted to roll the clock back to when, you know, children weren't even told that their father had died <laughs> or, you know, and sort of, you know, that nobody ever asked a child, you know, what are you, what, what are you making of this particular situation? It was just, you know, children should be seen and not heard. And that idea of, you know, it's good to talk, we must open up, we must undo the stiff upper lip, Brits, Brits in particular are screwed up. Um that be, do you think there's something positive that's happened uh, in the kind of, is there a, a sort of greater sensitivity to others and to oneself that might have arisen from a therapy culture? Or is there a kind of a broader vocabulary that people can use to describe emotions now? Is there any sense that there's been an enrichment? Well, of course. I mean, we don't want to stigmatize people for mental health problems any more than we would any other health problem, right? Why would we make them feel bad if they go to a therapist? Sometimes going to a therapist is the right best thing to do. And um, so, of course, is this a vast overcorrection? Yes, the overcorrection is so dramatic. The British people don't even, I, I don't know if a British young even know that there was anything good about the stiff upper lip. <laughs> and there was. It was remarkable what people were able to get through and triumph over and how strong they were and how good the young people felt. I mean, <laughs> just the amount of sex teenagers were having during the Blitz was unbelievable in Britain. <laughs> and part of that, obviously, I'm not saying teenagers should be at having more sex, but but it's hard to deny that they were also full of joy and um, and and that that is one indication of it. We want kids at the very least to want sex, even if they're not having it. Yeah, I mean, it's kids, I don't mean kids, young people, you know, teenagers mm -hmm. at the very least to want it. And we're mm -hmm. seeing today young people who don't even seem to want it. And one of, one of, you know, so we're seeing in this very sad population, a feeling of helplessness, all things that you would see if they were convinced that they were really disabled in some way, incapacitated. And I, they say that they are. They are taking in the U.S. They are taking days off to work, to attend to their mental health. Um, this, these are not people dealing with severe disability. Largely, these are bummed out kids. These are, you know, they are. There's no question their mood is low, but also they believe that they've experienced debilitating trauma. They believe that they have bad mental health. Less than half of the of, of of young people in the U.S. believe their mental health is good. Mm -hmm. Yes, because saying that you your um, mental health is good is almost a sign that it isn't good <laughs> because you're supposed right, to be the sensitive. Opposite. Yeah. It's the opposite. Dwelling on past pain, rehashing it, ruminating, that's the number one symptom of depression. And it can increase and induce depression. But that's what young people are doing. They're rehashing and dwelling on and, and, and curating their own pain. What do you, I mean, what do you think we're avoiding when we turn to therapy to help us raise our children? I think we're avoiding asserting our own authority. Mm -hmm. And I think I do place a lot of the blame in the mental health experts for terribly undermining parents' confidence that they knew what they were doing with their own children. They are constantly telling parents that they need to practice these techniques and this is the way to talk to your child and this is the way to handle every bit of parenting. We, we, we don't often see the results, you know, and when we do, they're not impressive to say the least, but th a lot of the people giving this advice, I, I wish we could see who they had raised, because I promise you, if you talk to someone in the older generation who has raised a good adult to maturity, and you see that they have raised a person who can de be depended upon to show up for work, to build stable relationships, to show up for a friend, if you, if they have raised that person, they're worth talking to. To me, mm. that's the only sort of parenting expert that's sort of worth their salt. So what they are, it, it, it are values, aren't they? Those are, va I mean, very simple values in a way, aren't they? You know, including things like for children, be child level values of being kind, of, of being friendly and of doing things for other people, which are really basic level moral lessons in a way. It yes, does seem like those yes. have been undone and we're unwilling to even make those Demands. That's right. They convinced us that it was a matter of expertise as parents. We always had to practice their methods. We were never good enough. And we always had to run back to them to check in about whether our methods were working. If you teach values, you say, teach your kids to be good, to know right from wrong. And then you are, you have to punish if they fail that you have no choice, right? You have to assert your authority. They have to, um, 
be, you know, intimidated by losing your high regard. They have to be afraid of losing your high regard. It can't be guaranteed in every instance, no matter their behavior, but all of a sudden you can trust them. And one of the things we're not giving young people is independence. We don't trust them to exert their own judgment, to exercise their own judgment because we haven't taught them judgment, right? We haven't given them the conditions for good judgment. They need to be able to take risks without all the monitoring and surveillance. And that's how you build a stronger young person. And one of the things that's been said about this way of raising children is that it, it actually, um, it looks like it's child-centered. But actually, it's often putting the needs of the parent first in a way that doesn't, it's not obvious that that's what's going on, but actually, there's a very strong parental attachment to the child that requires the affirmation coming from the child. So the, the child's you know, behaving well is an affirmation of you, the child um, saying, mummy, I love you, rather than I hate you. Why did you deprive me of this thing that I, I wanted? It has become a, a very needy kind of relationship of adult to child, which is a complete reversal, presumably, of the way things ought to be. Well, one thing that w- when the therapists, you know, and the, and the mental health professionals convinced us that we needed to practice these techniques that they were expert techniques we, we, we poured and that all for, the, for their mental health, it required a constantly striving, ec- working parent who was there for everything, who was endlessly supportive of everything they did and endlessly cheering. It meant that we poured a huge number of hours into these children. And once we did that, which we did, that no generation has gotten more parental attention than this one. Once we did that, once we were told that we were guilty if we ever missed a practice or we ever weren't there cheering at every game, um, we wanted something in return because they had become our best friends and we wanted to be their best friends. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think it set us up for you know, a, bad, a, a, a bad circumstance, a bad paradigm. People often find it really hard to believe that that the figure on um, uh, parental attention and the, the amount of attention children now receive from their parents. People always think that, oh, because women go to work, everybody feels really busy um, and then the children are kind of consigned to daycare and then a little bit of time in the evening before bed. But actually, if you look at any statistics on the amount of time that the parents actually spend with their child directly doing things with them, playing with them, nurturing them in a very direct kind of way it's uh it's phenomenal the number of hours that are up for women more than men but for men as well uh which people found really counterintuitive because everybody feels like they haven't got enough time that's right we're pouring attention we're tracking them with our phones yeah i mean i talk to parents who track their kids they're young you know in graduate school they're still tracking their kids movements on their phones these kids are being endlessly surveilled they're being endlessly submitted to various kinds of pointers and feedback. And honestly, it's overwhelming. I mean, I talked to the great um, American psychologist, uh, academic psychologist, Peter uh, Gray, who told me that when they want to, in laboratory settings, increase stress on an individual, um, what they do is they monitor, they add monitoring. It's virtually the same as adding stress. And there are no, there has never been a more monitored generation than this one. They are be getting constant feedback and supervision and intervention from adults, and they are the most stressed out kids. Mm. On a positive note, I, you, if you talk to parents, they often say the the kid knows to turn off the monitoring, <laughs> and so <laughs> what what the what the uh, undergraduate child does now is to just deny the parent any kind of of contact intervention. Uh, and they, there may be a sort of instinctive understanding in young people that they do need independence. I mean, do you ha- do you think there is uh, grounds for a sense that there is some kind of pushback? Because I'm always having conversations with people whose kids at the age of 18, 19 are going off to South America from Brit- having never, you know, they've travelled with parents, but then they go off by themselves backpacking in Costa Rica and Mexico and Vietnam. And I'm... I, I can't square that because I always think, well, these are the helicopter generations. So how come they're all, you know, heading off there at the age of 18? I I think that's I think that's wonderful. If you know, if I I don't know the statistics in Britain, um, but I can tell you that in America, between the ages of 18 and 25, now over half are choosing to live with their parents. And we've never seen numbers like that. Mm -hmm. So. Are there kids, young people who are going out there and, and, you know, engaging in adventure? That's wonderful. I 
I hope more of them will do it. But what we're seeing in America certainly is young people showing up on college campuses and effectively having nervous breakdowns, um, absolutely emotionally unable to cope. They are um, running to the uh, psych clinics of their universities. And when they talk to, because I interviewed them, when they talk to the psych nurse or doctor there, when they report what's causing them so much stress, it's the most mundane of events, like mm -hmm. um, a boy not, not leaving your text on read, not replying and how much that torments you, or even getting a bad grade from a professor. These are things they never learn to cope with because their parents um, we're always running interference because they, because we were told for over a gen good generation, if you want to protect these kids from trauma, if you want to make them happy at every instant, that's what you need to do. You can never look away. And mm -hmm. so we never looked away. And uh, it, we, we've got a very, very uh, wound up generation as a result. We, we tend to talk about um, parents and there's been this kind of gender neutralization of that, but actually I, I think women are doing this very differently to men. And the, the kind of intensive parenting actually is usually motherhood. And the kind of the expert parent is very often the mother who's kind of professionalized the role, in, including incorporating therapeutic thinking into that. Do you think, is there any sense in that which men still are the kind of tougher guy, the one who makes the kid pick themselves up when they fall over, all those kinds of things that that dads might have done and paternal authority might have played that role. Do you think that's still continuing or dad's been infected with this too? I would actually, it, it's interesting. In some ways, the biggest change has come from men, from dads, because um, women always stereotypically were overprotective, you know, as a generalization, that doesn't mean every woman, but moms tended to be, men usually acted as a corrective so that the children had some balance. Um, and uh, today, unfortunately, I think a lot of dads, and by the way, this is true in same-sex relationships as well, the, 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 whoever the parent was who had sort of the dad style instincts, I'll call it, and it isn't necessarily a man, but the, the instincts that were to tell a kid, as we used to say in America, shake it off, you'll, you'll live, you'll be fine, keep, carry on. Um, they're no longer saying that because they're being so told over and over by the other parent, you're doing it all wrong. I've learned this. You're going to traumatize, you know, you're going to cause our child emotional damage. Um, and so we really see pe the, the father very often in, 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 certainly in America, you know, being told by mom, you can't, all of your instincts are wrong. Hmm. Yeah. In fact, I think that's come up in a few films recently in TV programs, culturally, people are picking up on that. The, um, yes. And one of the most helpful things that anybody ever said to me when I had very young children was always have a united front <laughs> with your part, with your husband against the kids <laughs> so that they couldn't kind of divide and rule and, and overrun you. And I, it was, it's always, I think it's a really, really important thing. Whereas if you've got those really different approaches and instincts and one has got the mantle of authority uh, attached to it the kind of more th softer therapeutic approach it's really difficult for the guy to then try and hold a line right and just to sort of you know uh, push back on that suggestion just a little I actually have come to believe that a certain amount of balance is very good for kids so yes of course you want a united front on things like values but if dad does things a little differently it's okay. And it used to be okay. And today moms don't tolerate it. Mm -hmm. And the, and they don't tolerate it from the grandparents either. If the grandparents don't parent or don't, you know, supervise in the way that mom likes the, in, in America, there are very high rates of cutting off the grandparents. And, you know, those are all really good. All these relationships are so good for children. There really is no substitute through, um, for enduring relationships where keep people love you and you love them back over time. So many studies have shown this. The relational stability that we're missing in the United States has been a, a tragedy for kids. And growing up with grandma who loves you, she's not perfect, okay? Nobody said she was perfect, but it doesn't matter. Kids can roll with it. And taking that away, taking away the cousins, and all the sense of connection that they're not alone in the world really has been terribly harmful for, for uh, young kids. Mm. Yeah. And the other thing about therapeutic authority is it's really unstable, isn't it? 
because it's you know it's fad driven there's not one there's not a development within the discipline there isn't one discipline um yeah. it's very that's that is partly why it's so discombobulating for parents i think because they know it's going to when i mean who talks about self esteem anymore that right. was a, exactly that was the impression. It's, it's subject to fad if you're dealing with a there in school therapist as a lot of people are she's not going to follow you to high school she's mm-hmm. not with you over the summer and what about, you know, uh, as you just said, when the new study comes out and the therapist totally reverses herself entirely, all she did was undermine all of mom's instincts. And, uh, you know, the best, uh, it, it's silly, but it, in a way, but the best compliment I got was this week, someone said, and it got sent to me, um, I listened to Abigail's podcast and um, and she said, uh, for the first time, I punished my son without guilt. And I love that. And I'll tell you why. Because I'm not here to tell parents when to public punish their kids or how. Okay. I have no interest in telling parents. What I'm saying is, and, and this woman had been public punishing her child. She's she when he was, you know, acting and in, 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 exhibiting bad behavior. She had been doing it, but she felt awful. And all I wanted to do really was to let parents trust their instincts and know that actually, if they if they cared, the research was on their side not on the side of these so-called experts who have flooded us with a lot of bad techniques, a lot of bad advice, terribly undermined our instincts and our confidence, and and really have made uh, the mental health of young people much, much worse. Yeah. I mean, we've all seen the the dog-eared star charts on people's refrigerators. And then what used to be the reward, the jars with the pasta in (laughs) <laughs> that I think it was a super nanny phenomenon who was a British invention that came over to the US on reality TV. And the number of uh, parents, whether you'd go to the kitchen <laughs> and they'd have like a, a dusty jar with half full of pasta, which is supposed to be rewards for good behavior. And then they'd forgotten about it because it didn't work. So they'd uh, abandoned that particular technique. And then it was something else. And but but now even punishment doesn't of any description seems to be um, seen as problematic. That's right. Uh, I, I think that they made us insecure about all the ways we had done it without providing ever any proof that their methods were good. And I, there were a lot of reasons to think a lot of the, the just thinking about your feelings, tell me how you're feeling. I want to hear how you're feeling. There's very good research that that's a terrible way to go about things, right? It pushes a kid into a state orientation, thinking about themselves rather than a task, making it much more difficult to complete a task, but also it's rumination. It's having a kid habituate and thinking about their pain. Whereas we want to do the opposite. We want to tell a kid, you're very strong, you'll be fine. And you know what? Some percentage of kids are badly hurt and they won't just be fine. But at least we can perform a certain triage and get the ones who will be fine back onto the field or the pitch. And the ones who won't be fine, then we can attend to them. One of the things that is noticeable over here, certainly, is that it's not as though this therapeutic approach serves the interests of children who are who are cognitively impaired, severely autistic, physically disabled. Those children, the parents are fighting all of their childhoods for access to support and for diagnoses and recognition. It's incredibly difficult, probably more than it ever has been to get that kind of support. How do you explain that gap? I love that you brought that up. And, and I could not agree more. You know, the the people who might say, oh, that's very uncompassionate of you or cold of you, I'd like them to talk to someone whose child is actually suffering. Because the number of parents who have reached out to tell me, my child has actual autism and is suffering, and we cannot get the resources we need. And the everyone who speaks for autistic children now, or whatever the, the malady, all kinds of things, from ADHD to other things, they, they, they have such mild forms, if at all, and they are, we are not getting the resources we need because they're speaking for us. My child can't operate in a normal classroom, okay? And they're pushing us to accept all the kinds of care based on children who don't really need it in their view. And, um, you know, I talked to this one woman, Sarah, I will never forget this. I, she, I, I call her Sarah, that's not her real name, but she's married to a woman and they're living in the United States. And her kids, she adopted three kids from foster care, she and her wife, and they had been through the most horrible childhood, um, the, the early years of their life filled with abuse. And she had the kids in public, what we call public school, sorry, a state school. And 
um, you know, they, she said, but she also had them in all kinds of therapy because they needed it. And she said one of the greatest pains in her life is she must drop her children off to a school where every teacher wants to play therapist and every counselor wants to play therapist and casually inquires about the children's trauma and asks them to share it. And she says, I am desperately trying to get my children through this school day. And I don't need these people playing amateur therapist in the middle of the school day with my children. It is not helping. And I just, I always think of her because I do believe we're not helping anybody with these things. We have a desperately underserved population that needs medication and, and, and therapy in the most serious way. And they are not helped by this casual culture of everyone gets therapy. And then the kids who don't need these drugs and don't need these medication, they are not learning to cope with normal life. We are not helping them either. Yeah. I mean, that's it. I've seen exactly that happen with, with children, with children who are adopted <clears throat> and uh, going to school, a brand new school, new family, new school overnight. And all, the, the only support really on offer were these kind of pseudo therapists within the school environment who were using the language of trauma to children who had genuinely experienced properly traumatic early childhood. And this frightening, the idea of kind of amateur amateur, amateur therapy coming into play in those kind of situations. Um, and what's um, what, one of, uh, on the question of instincts, I mean, how, do, how do you think parents now, given how far things have gone, can sort of rediscover their instincts, if you like. I mean, are they there to be rediscovered, do you think, or are they, have they gone and we need to do something else to kind of resurrect them? Uh, I think they are. I think they are. I mean, I think that all of this work is exhausting. And look, every parent knows their values. I don't know the values of your home, but you do. You know what it is you want to raise and what's important to you. If nothing else, you want your children to believe or, or feel strongly about the following. You have to communicate your values to your children before someone else comes in and does it. And, and that's, that's really what I want parents to know, that um, you know, you're probably surrounded by other people who have raised good adults. Ask them what they would do. And in America, I often find that I get the best sense, the most sensible advice from immigrants who aren't afraid to be called backwards by the experts, but will tell you what worked. And you know, you look back on a few generations, we have raised productive people in, in the West before. We have raised great people and they are load-bearing walls. They are um, people who can be relied upon to show up and, and try their best and be good neighbors and be good citizens and be good spouses and all the, all the rest of it. And it, my biggest concern is in our generation, they don't, in the rising generation, they don't feel up to that. They are opting out of all kinds of things like marriage, parenthood. They say they don't want to do these things. And I believe largely it's because they don't feel well enough to try. Mm -hmm. So you, can I, um, before we go out to the uh, q and I just wanted to ask you a couple of sort of free speech related questions, so, which sure. probably comes back more to the first book, to Irreversible Damage. Um, I noticed when I was reading it that you you spoke, I think, about um, your attachment to the First Amendment. And actually, that was a major motivation for writing Irreversible Damage because of your objection to compelled speech. And I just wondered whether when you started writing the book, you had any sense of how controversial it was going to be. Oh, the last one? <laughs> yeah, the last no. one. <laughs> no, you know, most books are hardly read. Um, and by the way, I should say, you know, the, there's, I, 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 because I'm talking to a British audience, especially, there's a wonderful young, before I, I answer that question, I just want to say one thing I should have said, which is that there's a wonderful young journalist, Freya India, who's done wonderful work on the generation, and she knows all about what's going on with young people in Britain specifically. And uh, anyway, she's she's written so beautifully on that, I just thought I'd mention that. But um uh, you know, did I expect the backlash of irreversible damage? No, of course not. Um, I Did I think it would be very controversial? Yes. Was I warned that I was going to get, you know, there were going to be personal threats to me? Yes. I was very well aware of many people, uh, very kind people reached out and said, you know, there's no uh, sort of scarier group than the trans activists. That's, that's what I was told at the time. Um, so I was aware of that. But, you know, you mentioned Target. That Target took the, deleted the book. They put it on for a week. Then they deleted it again. It has never been back on target. So the 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 level of 
exercise among this population of activists. They are so worked up. They will devote, you know, every last resource to banning one book in the U.S. Uh, at the time, it was one. There have since been, you know, many wonderful others uh, that was critical of um, this, you know, uh, uh, phenomenon with teen girls. Um, so uh, they 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 couldn't tolerate one book because they were terribly worried their monopoly would be bro broken up. I guess uh, the monopoly on the narrative. Um, even, even though there are, of course, dozens and dozens and dozens of books celebrating a uh, teenage transition. So, uh, yes, of course, it's, you know, the, the, the degree of uh, anger surprised me. So you'll now have the therapist with pitchforks coming up <laughs> with you as well. Although as it happens in the book, what's clear is a lot of serious therapists are spotting exactly what what you're spotting or well, they've already they've already known. They've always known that, that this was a problem and they want to they want to deal with the serious cases they don't necessarily not that's all of them right. want to be kind of colonizing the whole of our lives that's right I, I you know the thing is i met so many i mean both books i met so many wonderful people and it, that was in some sense the best part was getting to meet so many incredible um you know academic psychologists academic psychiatrists i learned about evolutionary psychology um and people were reaching out to say you know this is uh, bad practice. I mean, I talked to the great British sociologist, Frank Ferretti, who was truly a joy uh, to, to talk to. And I, I learned so much from him about sort of the way parenting had changed, but also evolutionary psychologists who taught me that, you know, anxiety and depression are adaptive. They exist for a reason and they come with a lot of good things like um, good anxiety helps you produce good memories, um, like anxiety helps performance. Um, like depression can uh, help you think about what you've done that's gone wrong and give you the and help you till you find the motivation to um, make a change in your life that you may need to make. All these things, if we delete them with medication, not in adults, adults, it's up to them. That's not my business in some sense. But with children who are still figuring out how to cope with these things, I think there are really deleterious effects of that. And, and I really think one would, should only introduce a whole lot of these medications uh, if they are absolutely necessary. And then, uh, so a, a sort of second free speech related question is- Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, that therapeutic culture seems to be uh, quite a helpful way of understanding some of the newer attacks on freedom of speech and freedom more broadly. So the invocation of safe spaces, I feel unsafe as the, as the way in which debate is shut down. Um, have we created a, a kind of generation that is emotionally tyrannical? I mean, is this what we've done? Yes. And when they say, I feel unsafe, what are they saying? They're saying, I'm going to be an emotional trauma. Well, who told them that? Why do they believe that well, they will forever be scarred by hearing something they don't agree with? Right. I, I you know, I, I think it's worth asking who did that, because it's it's that's the only chance we'll have of turning it around. And I think they really do believe that if you experience something negative, you can never get beyond it. And that's wrong. And I do believe that to have free speech, a population can only handle and and thrive from free speech if they or they will only want to if they feel up to it, if they feel it won't kill them in some ways or incapacitate them. And that was a that was a terrible lie that was told to them. Uh, and and we really need to go in and correct it. They're going to be fine, <laughs> needless to say. But even if they went through really hard times, the story of human resilience, the numbers, you look at the research, the resilience is overwhelmingly the norm, the 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 majority response to trauma. Mm. And and we need kids to remember that. And 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 dear God, especially Brit British children. You know, I mean, Americans as well, but British children, they they have grandparents and great grandparents who can tell them this. Yeah. And do you ever feel like we get sort of trapped within psychological concepts, though? Because I remember years ago noticing that resilience was being talked about as a sort of not in a kind of moral sense, but in a psychological sense and it, as not a, a not as a default position as it happens. It was kind of a, well, we must intervene in order to inculcate. Right. Right. That's how they, they play the game. Which is the complete opposite. Right. They <laughs> say we're arguing. going to, that's what they say. They're going, we're going to introduce coping techniques and we will help children build resilience. Now, children, let's talk about a time when you were really sad. 
That's how they proceed. Now, does that sound like resilience? It's not. It's the opposite. And there's good research that, you know, that shows that. But they proceed, they they call it resilience and they make kids absolutely afraid to take risks on their own, to trust their gut. They make, they force kids to dwell constantly on an emotional injury and thereby exacerbate or magnify that injury. And lo and behold, these kids aren't so resilient. Yeah. I mean, so I just sometimes I wonder whether how deep it goes with children, because sometimes I've noticed with, you know, knowing a lot of late teenagers, they start to take the take the mickey out of these very the vocabulary. And so they will kind of um, they're sort of sati- they become satirical about ang- my anxiety and, and social anxiety and these kinds of I wonder I, I don't think it undoes the harm. But there's definitely a sort of meta awareness that they seem to sort of develop as well. I mean, I think that's wonderful. I mean, you know that, you know, we all know that humor is one of the best resources we have psychologically is poking fun at things. I think that's incredibly healthy. But talking to kids about anxiety, teaching them to say, I have anxiety, that's my anxiety, reifying it as this giant burden you live with, that's not doing them any good. And uh, too many adults are doing that with children. Yeah. Uh, okay, great. Thanks, Abigail. So far, let's, um, oh my goodness, 31 questions. <laughs> so this is from somebody who works as a child and adolescent mental health um, specialist in the UK health service. Uh, and he says, I see every day how language is dominated by a complete capitulation to trans ideology. I fear I am complicit in harming, not helping the children and young people who use the service. How can this be challenged effectively at an organisational level? Any individual therapist or worker risks at best isolation amongst colleagues and at worst being deregistered by professional regulatory bodies. Uh, Is this going on in the we uh, before we started, we talked about the different health systems. I mean, do you think in the States it would be similar? Absolutely. We have something called uh, conversion therapy bans in, I don't know how many states we're up to now. Last I checked, it was 21 states um, where you you could absolutely lose your license if you uh, told a child, oh, you know, I don't, I don't think you have gender dysphoria and didn't you want to use their pronouns? Um, I think I don't know what to do with these questions because on the one hand, I feel a lot of compassion. I don't want someone to lose their job either. But I also think that a hard stop should be harming children. So if you believe you are harming children, well, stop harming children. I I don't know another way to say that. And I don't know what the professional repercussions will be, but gosh, uh, what about the other repercussions? I mean, uh, if, if you believe you're harming children, stop. Please. <laughs> I, I don't know a nice and easy way out of that. Yes. We also have conversion ban, conversion therapy ban legislation going through the houses down here over here as well. Okay. Um, so somebody says that as a teacher, we're expected to teach students discipline and behaviors that should be or should have been taught by parents. Yes. Um, so which way around is it? I mean, it seems like the institution of the school and the education system has really driven this stuff, but at the same time, they feel like they're stepping into a deficit that's been left by parents. So where do you think, I mean, is it useful to blame either either or? I think that's a great response to me, which is that, and, and by the way, I got that from many teachers who basically said, these kids are showing up, they're entirely dysregulated, they have never heard the word no, what am I to do with them? And I think that's a fabulous response. and. And they're right. Um, The good teachers will always say that to me. And I I love that response. I wish they weren't also saying to me, and I can't deal with this, these children anymore, and I can't deal with what's going on in schools. I'm I'm quitting, which I heard a lot when Mm -hmm. I was interviewing teachers. Mm -hmm. Uh, The best teachers very often said, I just can't take it anymore. Um, I think that there's no question COVID made you look. For a generation now, parents have been afraid to assert their own authority, no matter how good we know it to be for young people's mental health. They have not used the word no whenever they could avoid it with their children. And they give them way too much tech. There's no question these kids are on way too much technology. They show up without an attention span to school, having never heard the word no. Uh, 
never able to test their limits, never engaging in unsupervised play. And they're a mess when they show up for school. And now what's a teacher to do? I think that's a great response. And I would just say, that's why I'm trying to point the finger at what I believe to be the source of a lot of this nonsense and where everyone got these ideas. And I think it's the same people who had nothing to say about the lockdowns, who had nothing to say about the very foreseeable uh, fact that we were going to end up with young people who had been in solitary confinement for going on two years, two academic years. Um, they are responsible and they are not the cure. They had an opportunity to speak up and, 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 and certainly in America, they did not. Um, and they didn't because they were interested in other things like maintaining, I think, their own influence. But they, they absolutely should have issued public warnings about things like uh, the social media, and 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 during the school day especially, and of course they should have said had a lot to say about the lockdowns, and they didn't. Yes, and so one of the questions actually uh, is about lockdown and whether there's a danger among some of the people who are very critical of lockdown and the effect on children is to kind of un to frame it as a mental health epidemic. That's what's being caused. Is there a way of sort of stepping outside that way of framing everything? Right. So the very people who had nothing to say about the lockdowns now present themselves as the solution to the mental health problems that we're seeing, many of which were just foreseeable. Every parent knew this. OK, and parents spoke up. But I will say this. I don't believe there's the solution. And here's the thing. We will see some readjustment as these kids. We knew we would as these kids try to go back to school and deal in an environment they hadn't had to deal with for a while. But that doesn't mean you introduce, you let loose this army of therapists who are introducing already so many, so many other harms. Mm. Okay. Mm. Um, and I don't think we should be, and, and British, the British are so wonderful at this. You know, when they see uh, evidence-based um, studies like this new study out of folks, there's another study, a new study out of Australia, the Wise Teens study. Um, I think the researcher there was Harvey, although I may be wrong, but I think that's his name. There are two incredible studies showing these school-based mental health interventions are not, are counterproductive. Why are we doing this? And the people who claim to be in charge of our parenting, they really, really, many of them do not know what they're doing. And, and I do think they've, they've done terrible damage to the parent-child relationship. So somebody who I presume is an academic, uh, Patis, I can't say the name, Patihis uh, et al, uh, published a paper in 2019. And he says that we found that it was easy to reappraise mothers using therapy-like prompts in which we asked them to write a few sentences about recent examples of what their mother has done. Um, uh, I'm trying to understand what he's asking. I think it's, okay, so I think there are, uh, maybe it was a study that was a, a kind of form of intervention with current mothers, asking them to reflect on the way they were mothered by their own mothers. I might be misunderstanding that. Um, and it helped them to adjust the way, the, the level of love that they had for their own mothers, as well as the way they felt about their own child. And that does, that's interesting, because there does seem to be these kinds of breaks that have gone on between the generations. And, you know, you talk about the estrangement that's increasingly happening between parents and children, children and grandparents. Again, how do we kind of rebuild those bonds and make it just unacceptable to break them, really? Yes, we we just start by reasserting our own authority. We mm. stop listening to the experts. We stop letting them tell us that our own parents didn't know what they were doing. I mean, I always ask someone, um, you know, who's you know these you see these parenting experts. You know how many parenting experts um, in the U.S. <laughs> you know, you, you often hear these people, you know, hold themselves out as experts. They have no children, or they have one five year old, and they are teaching techniques. Look, I, you know, there have also been good studies on various techniques and why they're not helpful. But I don't think anyone should take the advice of someone who who hasn't shown that they that that they know what they're talking about and known what know what they're doing, and um and and your parents on the other hand the grandparents you can evaluate the job they did, and if they did a decent job if they did a pretty good job raising self sufficient adults who can be relied upon to behave like adults, well gosh I I think they have something to offer I do, 
Mm-hmm. And if they're and for the child in in question, they have a lot to offer. This so here's a very interesting question then about um this kind of tension between parents needing in some ways to be more um more well to be more authoritative so kind of get stuck in in a particular way but also be prepared to be uh, more hands-off in other ways so uh, somebody um says that she deprogrammed her daughter with the help of irreversible damage um and she says that for parenting hands-off isn't the answer because we need to know the phone content uh what you know watching what's going on how the children are responding to the media they may be consuming and even what the school might now be teaching them so that's the problem isn't it because hands-off requires you to be able to trust the world right and if you don't that's a great comment i love that comment and i'll just say this you're right about a lot of it it's a question of what you're hands-on about So I believe, look, if you have a child in crisis, they've already gone, they're heading down the, you know, gender dysphoria, you know, I have, I have trans identification route. I I give different advice. So obviously this book is generally about, you know, uh, uh, all the therapeutic interventions that aren't helping and parents reasserting their authority, especially when it comes to the values of their home. Um, Too many parents were willing to let the gender ideology activists teach kids basics, you know, (laughs) uh, about, uh, you know, what makes a girl and whatnot. Um, but, but look, if, if you have a kid going down a bad path, like transgender identification, um, absolutely. And of course I wrote about that in my last book. I read about that in this one, you have to get them out of the situation, but that requires, and here's the kicker that requires parental authority. If the th- authority of the parent is so undermined, if they feel like they have to rely on an expert every step of the way, if they shove their child at a therapist, they're very unlikely to be able to do that. They're unable to be able to carry out the rescue mission. Mm. And that doesn't mean there aren't good therapists that are very helpful. There are. But I want people to realize this, that in almost every case, I probably interviewed, talked to, I probably talked to a thousand parents by the time I was done because I talked to hundreds before I started Uh, as I was writing the book and just after, and then in the years after, I've talked to so many more of parents who had a daughter going down this path of transgender identification. And here's what I want them to know. In almost every case, the young woman already had a therapist she was working with. Very often the therapist, when they were done talking about, you know, her trauma, they then uh, uh, over a breakup in the third grade, they would then say, and tell me about your gender. So very often, they, the, the last book was a story, in a sense, of iatrogenic mischief made by therapists. This is just a broader look at all the mischief being made by therapists. Hmm. Yeah, so that um, this never-ending therapy is very interesting because I think probably parents going into it don't think that it's going to be there forever. They may think it's a, it's a short-term solution where... They don't know what to do at this particular right. moment because the child seems to have a distress that doesn't seem normal, seems beyond normal. But but really, it's a crisis of confidence in most cases. Very often, the 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 the, the parent tells me they they don't like this, but I just can't. So I can't take her out of that school. She loves it. I can't take away her binder. She'll be furious at me. I can't. They feel like they can't do what they believe is right. And whenever I would talk to a mother who was afraid to take away her, you know, 12, 13, 14 year olds binder, but the breast compression garment, I would say to her, will you let her smoke cigarettes in your home? Well, no, they would never let that. Well, why would you let her do this? She's deforming breast tissue. She, you're making it more likely she's going to go forward with the surgery. Why would you let her? It really is, to a large extent, a crisis of confidence. And that's why the parents who were more confident, who took their children out of that situation dramatically in various ways, uh, either by removing them from the school, moving across the country, they did various things, sending them to a horse farm. They ended up doing, in many ways, faring the best. Now, it depends what age your daughter goes down this route. It's very once they reach university, it's very difficult to do very much to to turn things around. But um, but that that's mostly what I found with with parents of younger girls. Um, we've had a, a few questions actually on a similar vein about um, now that 
the trans ideology is there within the therapeutic profession um where would parents turn to when they really do feel that there is a, a serious issue how on earth can they find uh expert support when they do think they need it if there's been a capture of all the major institute uh, psychological institutions that's the problem i usually send people to organizations like genspect which is very good um but um but you you cannot it's hard to exaggerate the hunger for uh that parents have for getting some expert to tell my daughter what i could tell her myself so i'm not you know I, you know, I, I'll get, let me just give you an example to be clear. I got a call from a man who was Catholic. Um, he's upper middle class Catholic. And then I think he was an engineer a few years ago after I'd written the book. And he said, um, I need a, you know, can you recommend any therapist? This is, this is very, this is the kind of call I would get all the time. You know, can you recommend a therapist for our daughter? I ha she has a therapist. She's been working for years, but things are getting worse. She's getting more into this identity. Okay. How old is she now? She just turned 16. You know, tell me about her. Well, we let her leave the Catholic school. That was our choice because she really wanted to go to the art school. Now in art school, she's even more further down this road. She's really convinced she's a boy. Everyone's celebrating her. It's getting worse. And the therapist isn't helping. Can you find another therapist? But putting aside therapy for a second or whether any therapy could help because some might you see how unwilling he was to assert his own authority with his daughter. He let her go to a school that he didn't think, you know, communicated his values. He thought it was harming her. She was getting further down this path towards serious harm, serious self-harm. She was already calling herself a new name and whatnot. And she had an expert already. She had been, he had been outsourcing his parenting to an expert. Now he wanted a new expert to fix it. Hmm. So that's, that's what I'm seeing in terms of, parent reliance on experts for things they could do, mm -hmm. like put their foot down and say, we're going, you're going to the Catholic school because that's our values or whatever mm -hmm. it is. I'm, I look, I'm not pushing for any particular school, but you see what I mean? Do you think, um, I mean, so to avoid getting into the parent blaming trap, because right. obviously this has been a relentless culture on parents for 20 odd years. For sure. um, and it's very, very hard to assume an independent path away from everything that you see and read, which really was moving in one direction only in the last 20 years. So do you think that we need, does there need, is there any way in which there can be a kind of political pushback against this as well as that can bolster individual parents? I mean, in America, I think there have been more kind of parental movements that have been politicized than there ever have been over here. We just don't have that kind of phenomenon so far. Well, Yes. I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm certainly not parent blaming. I mean, if you read the book, my, my, my whole point is that parents need to trust themselves more and the experts less. Right. But doing what's right for your kids is very hard. It's really hard. And I think today it's the hardest, but you can't do it without authority. If you aren't ready to assert your authority, I know what's best for you with your children, then you'll never take away the smartphone, even when you need to. Mm -hmm. And you'll never set down all kinds of guidelines. I mean, the number of parents I talked to who would were reluctant to tell their kids, in this house, we believe girls have XX chromosomes. You are my daughter. And if you're reluctant to tell your daughter what you believe to be true, what you know is true, then you're just setting her up for someone else who's going to tell her what they believe. Mm. And that's what I'm worried about. Mm. I'm worried about other people coming in and say, no, actually, you were emotionally traumatized by what your mother said. No, actually, you really are a boy. We have to get these kids ready for that because there's so many in society, there's so many uh, experts so, and, and, and activists who are eager to tell your kids what the what what you know what the what their values are and do you think that the degree to which those activists or you know kind of new ways of think completely new ways of thinking about sex for example or um you know what's good for a child do you think have we ever lived in a historical period where they've been quite so distant from what was normal what used to be common sense because that's the thing i really feel for right. us 
her parents, which is just so disconcerting and disorienting to have this phenomenon, you know, to see your child actually behaving in a way that isn't familiar to you. So to have a very anxious child and not just think, oh, they're a bit of a nervous Nelly or they're a bit shy or, you know, not to you be able to use that old terminology for there to be these new terms. It, it's incredibly um, disorienting. That's for right. parents and, and then and the trans other people like that on acid, isn't it? Or speed, whatever it is. <laughs> steroids, steroids. <laughs> right. Um, and and the worst part is other people will diagnose your kid. I know some I know a parent who, um, you know, the one child uh, was having uh, I, I guess she wasn't as smart as her as her sibling. And the nanny told her, oh, you have a learning disability. And the child now is convinced she has a learning disability. There wasn't even a test. But but it's very easy to convince children of things and um, especially about themselves and uh, and and throwing around diagnoses. We need to stop this habit of casually diagnosing children, especially uh, and teenagers, because it will change how they see themselves. Hmm. Well, what seems to be a really common script at the moment, which is that the adults say, they would, or the parents say, I was trying to understand my child and seek for help for my child. They got an ADHD diagnosis. And then I realized that I had it. And so did my father and my brother. And that kind of retrospective diagnosis of your childhood disorder <laughs> seems right. to be really common. And then you think, well, okay, well, th this is right. not just children, it's adults who are also really hungry. For right. These diagnoses. Uh, that's a fantastic point. You, you see that a lot. And I certainly see that people say, I wish I had realized that this was anxiety when I was a kid. Look, yeah. uh, we all think about those moments where we felt unsupported, when we felt like we didn't get enough help for a genuine problem. The problem is, here's the big problem. We tend to exaggerate how often that occurred. So we're, we're raising an entire generation based on a tiny number of instances when we felt unsupported, as if they are always feeling unsupported. Mm -hmm. And it's actually fairly rare, you know, the, the times in which um, most adults, you know, felt like the, you know, people in their lives really blew it and didn't see they were in genuine pain. If you look across their lives, it, it usually isn't very often. Mm. And we're we're rushing in and with wheelchairs to an entire generation telling them to hop in before we ever see if they're ha if they're actually struggling. Yes. And, and one of the things that I found really sort of it, it, disturbing in the book uh, and makes me feel almost, I don't know what it is. It's a kind of really nauseous almost feeling when I'm reading the scenarios of parents describing um, when they just don't know what how to parent their child. Um, especially when with younger ones. And it's almost that it is that sense that the child really is alone in that sense now because the parent doesn't know how to connect with them. And, and that idea of, of actually not even really able to love your child because their idi idiosyncrasies are a kind of, of uh, a measure of your own failure rather than the very thing you love about the child. There's a lovely example in the book, actually, you give of a father who does see his child as wonderfully idiosyncratic. Yes, yes, uh, about his ADHD. And that was the thing that troubled me so much. One of the things that troubled me was when I was in interviewing parents, they were referring to, and I heard all around me, my ADHD kid, that's my sensory processing disorder kid or whatever. And I realized it not only changed the way the children saw themselves, it was interfering with the way parents saw their own children. They didn't see it as quirks. They didn't see it as, look, he's he's a little, you know, odd in this way, but so was his grandfather. They were seeing it as a disability and reacting that way and communicating that to the child. And really, unless there's an absolute need, and there may be, but in the absence of that, why would you introduce diagnosis into the parent-child relationship? Um, but But very often that's what parents were doing. Yes. And then in, in the school setting, I'm sort of jumping around a bit because I'm, I'm yeah. half looking at the Q&A box. And I'm listening to you at the same time and thinking my own questions. But so um, uh, one of my former colleagues, actually, uh, Jenny Bristow, who I think you referred to. Oh, the, yes. She's yeah. the best. I she's love here. her. Yeah. So yeah. she's um, she's asking, you know, what is it in, in schools? What gets pushed aside in order to make space for the therapeutic? 
So when you do have social and emotional aspects of learning, as it's called over here, you know, people used to joke about circle time and this kind of thing. What is it? What is it the schools then don't have time for when they introduce the therapeutic? That's a great question. I would love st- schools to answer that. I mean, performance has never been worse in American schools, right? Um, so that's right. It takes up time. Uh, it doesn't work, as some wonderful new studies point out. Um, but it and it's ca- worse. It's counterproductive. It often can even undermine the parent-child relationship. As the uh, counselor, we call them in in the U.S., a school counselor or teacher. Um, or mental health staff uh, uh, invites the class to, you know, discuss whether the parent was in a right in the right in a particular situation. So they're passing judgment on the parents. Um, these are not helpful, and they are taking the place of learning. All this talk about anxiety <laughs> and uh, math anxiety—they like to call it—that's not helpful when you sit down to do math. Yeah, uh, and that, that sort of. Um... Again, it moves away from proper knowledge yes. that has got a kind of weight of history to it where it's been handed down. You know, we always teach them about the Romans and Henry VIII, and <laughs> that's very different to the latest, you know, whatever the latest technique they're being taught, but, which will change you, from... Yeah. Yeah, hmm. sorry. But also if you're teaching them things, you're making them stronger. If you're telling them, teaching them history, if you're teaching them math, you're making them stronger. Nobody in our obsession with what will make my kid happy Nobody asks what will make them stronger. And that will, teaching them skills, teaching them, no, you know, giving them knowledge, that makes them stronger. Teaching them coping techniques when they aren't already suffering, it, no, it, it doesn't make them stronger. Um, somebody's just uh, raised the empathy, which I loved in the book. Uh, there's oh, something about that. Yeah. Tell us about empathy and why it's actually not very kind at all. <laughs> Sure. So I, I, I worked, I, you know, this is, you know, uh, largely in reference to a wonderful book by uh, Paul Bloom, uh, who's a psychologist and um, academic psychologist at Yale. But basically what he showed was that empathy has a very narrow aperture. We can only empathize with one or two people at a time. We're just not built to empathize with everyone at once. You can't do it. And the problem with all the empathy focus is that it very unlike things like fairness and justice, which you can apply across the board, if you focus on empathy as your guide, if you emphasize empathy, it very often goes along with cruelty to outsiders, privileging the the suffering, the sufferer in front of you with whom you emphasize, uh, sorry, with yeah, whose feelings you you emphasize, and it goes along with very cruel behavior to the outsiders, and. We see this again and again, very often exaggerating the pain of the person in front of you gives you sort of license to treat others cruel, cruelly. So in the book, I give examples of social emotional schools in which they were, they set up these show trials and were actually incredibly cruel to students based on one student's complaint where everyone rushed to empathize with, empathize with one student and was ended up actually very cruel to uh, the 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 child she was complaining about. Um, so that's that's the problem with empathy. If you emphasize fairness, you can treat everyone fairly, but emphasize emphasize empathy and you may end up with with really uh, uh, cruel treatment of the out group. Yes, uh, we absolutely see that. and I think that's the cancel culture phenomenon I's got that, absolutely. That's absolutely central to it, isn't it? I think yes, absolutely. Absolutely. A false empathy with with the imagined victim, and that allows you to be absolutely cruel to the person you've you've said is the perpetrator. Yeah, I'm um, certainly something that we deal with all the time amongst our caseload of uh, of people who've fallen foul of it. Right, I'm going to carry on skimming through these huge <laughs> huge numbers of uh, comments. Uh, okay, quite a few mentions actually of war. Interesting enough, which I know over in Britain, we've had this conversation recently in, you know, the kind of, I don't know, on it's various comment, commentators have been talking about, you know, could we defend ourselves in the event of a war? It's obviously thrown up by um, the situation that Israel's found itself in. Um, and uh, I noticed that it's Japan and Israel that you use as the kind of counterpoints to this culture. Is there, do you think that, uh, well, Japan it presumably isn't war, that's, that means they've got a very different approach to, to child rearing. 
Um, they have a very different approach. And it's so interesting because one of the things I talk about in the book is the wonderful emphasis that Japanese and Israelis place on child independence. And that what that means is the kids are walking to school by themselves at a very young age. They're doing errands. They are um, they are expected to have responsibilities and 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 their mental health in things like anxiety and depression is better. Now here's kids need, and we know this is great research on this, that kids need a certain amount of risky, you know, um, play and opportunities for real danger and responsibility. And that makes them stronger. And we're seeing that firsthand. And I think there's no better evidence than seeing the young Isra Israelis go off to war. Gen Z in Israel blew everyone away. They went off, they answered the call, and they went in and fought for their country. And if you are an American seeing that, I can tell you, in America, we cannot imagine it for most of this generation. Okay? We can't because we haven't given, we haven't raised, um, you know, and we aren't in the process of raising kids who feel like they have responsibility, who are looking forward to taking on more responsibility to behave like adults. Um, our kids are asking for mental health days off of work. And I, I, I think we badly need to turn this around in the, well, in the West and we see some very good examples. But to do that, you need society as a whole, don't you, to back the parents up. So Absolutely. Yeah. the scenario that always occurs to me is like, you know, when I was a child, I think if I was playing up uh, and my, you know, giving my mother a hard time out in public, another adult would say, you do what your mummy says. Right. And that my nowadays, I think if you said that to somebody right. else's child, the parent would feel terribly judged That's and, right. and diminished rather than bolstered in their authority. And they might well defend the child and say, well, you don't know what she's had a very difficult day. She's very tired or she's got ADHD or whatever. And so you, the, the kind of dynamic is continually destroying even those sort of fairly spontaneous attempts at, Absolutely. at solidarity. Absolutely. Our culture has been terrible. And I quote an Indian woman in the book. She was an immigrant from India. And she said uh, to her parenting coach, you know, my, I would never have talked to my daughter the way my daughter in, in back in India, the way my daughter and here in America speaks to me. And I thought I couldn't figure out why. But then we were back in India and I realized it. Because in America, when it, in India, when a child misbehaves, everybody looks at the child and glares at her and basically communicates, you better listen to your parents. And in America, when a child misbehaves, they glare at the parents. And I think our culture has been wildly unsupportive of parents. I think parents should not wait for it to be handed back our authority because we're not going to get it. Every force in society is undermining our authority with our kids undermining our sense that we know what's best. But I, I, you know, I really do think giving kids, being, raising kids, telling them you can handle this. You are going to be just fine. Work it out, mm -hmm. figure it out um, with things we know they can handle with things we handled at their age. That's a very good message for children. Yeah, I mean, I noticed you also cite uh, Lenora Skenazy. Yes. The book, and the let go. So Lenora Skenazy wrote a fa fabulous book called Free Range Kids. A long I was time hoping, ago, on the first. I was hoping you knew about that. Yes, that so she has a movement in America to try to do just that, to try to get galvanized parents to get kids more freedom, more mm -hmm. chores, more tasks, more responsibility to help deal with anxiety by giving them kids more responsibility and more independence. Yeah, and it's a fantastic thing. It's um, I've been watching it and talking to Lenora over the years about about the movement, and um, so the movement is called Let Grow, and she's even yes. pushed as far as legislation in some states, I think, um, to try to make it possible for children to have the freedom, for example, to come home from school by themselves or to go to the play park by themselves without their parents being reported to the police, which was happening right. <laughs> incredibly. Uh, and I mean, just I don't know that it's happened quite so much over here, but I know that. Any child out by themselves now under the age of eight just looks incredibly exposed because there's no other children around. Um, and it's very difficult to be the parent that lets your child out because you oh, feel this. like you're doing it in almost in a kind of very conscious act rather than it just being the thing that everybody does. It becomes a very conscious act to send them to the shop to get to right. run an animal or to go and knock it on somebody's door. Exactly right. I don't blame parents at all for not having done this. 
Okay. There is, we have the most unsupportive, in fact, undermining of, you know, parental authority culture. It's horrible. It's, they make the job so much harder, but here's the thing that I want parents to know. I want them to stop feeling guilt when they want to assert their authority, when they feel they should, because it's not more compassionate to let your child off the hook. It's not. You may be setting your child up for a lifetime where they don't feel like they can get through hard things, where they don't feel they can do for themselves. And that's least compassionate. Mm -hmm. So if your child, if you know a child can do something, if she's asking to try, I, I, I think you shouldn't feel guilt for letting her. You should feel good. Yeah, and turning around that what is said to be child-centeredness. Um, I think that's the, that's the almost the ship that needs to be turned around, isn't it? Because it's an illusion that this that what we've done is child centered, um, in a way that serves the interests of children. Um, yes, I think so. The distinction between adults and children. So you draw the line quite str- strongly in the book about you know well okay so for adults fine decide what you want to do when it comes to therapy and pursue whatever you want to pursue. With children, it's different. Similarly, you could say the same thing about the trans issue. But and how how to what extent do you think we've got a blurring of the boundary between adulthood and childhood, and that adults almost want to live in childhood rather than tell kids how great adulthood is going to be, and sort of really sell it to them, <laughs> and, and you know kind of give them the milestones like passing your driving tests, you know, or whatever it might be. Um, do you think adults have lost that? that sense that independence is a really great thing and it's something to be aspired to. Well, we took away all the status of adulthood. We placed ourselves on the status level of children and we took, we, we, there is nothing great. If you're going to tell your kids that you're basically the same as them, then there's no reason for them to aspire to anything, right? If you're going to drive them everywhere, if you're going to, you know, um, take over, if you're going to intercede with every teacher and constantly, you know, try to make them happy, well, then if you have, if you're set up like that, why would you ever want to grow up? You have the slave person who is devoted to making you happy at every instant. Everyone would want that, right? You have to let give kids the space and the freedom and the independence so that they want more. What are you going to yeah. say? I, I saw a, a thought cross your mind. What were you, <laughs> you had a reaction. What obvious. is it? Um, yeah. Yeah. I just, I mean, I'm all, because, because I know older yeah. children, they're, they're not children, they're young adults now. And I see the risks that they take. <laughs> well, I don't see them. I, I hear about them and I imagine that they're going on, you know, the drugs, the alcohol, the, I mean, girls in particular, oh my God. I mean, they really are not sh- living sheltered lives as far as I can see. Well, and they're going to music festivals at the age of 16. So I, this is the thing I don't quite get. because Okay, I'm really, so let me be clear. I, I absolutely yeah. think your description is right. When I say independence, it doesn't mean for everything. I'm not saying let your children hang out with pornographers, which is essentially <laughs> what they face online, right? Um, I'm not saying let them hang out with, you know, fentanyl addicts, because that doesn't seem like a good idea either. And yet, I guess you could say, well, that's independence. No, (laughs) I'm saying the things we evolved to handle, like getting a job after school, like walking to school and back on their own, like teaching them very clearly right from wrong, like doing chores. If you give them it, like giving them community that they're responsible for. That, that, that they have to participate in and do things for others. All that is very good. All mm. of that involves risks, right? But all of that is a good kind of risks. Those are the risks we evolved to handle. Now, social media, we didn't evolve to handle. Being made fun of by 2 million people is not anything that evolution has prepared us for. And I think that's very harmful for kids. Mm. I think the porn we're seeing online is very harmful for kids. And no, I don't think it makes your kid more independent to expose him to that. But I do think there's a very clear reason why we couldn't take away the phones from kids. There are a set of, there are a set of reasons. And uh, not only were we terrified, absolutely terrified of what would happen to them if we ever looked away, but I, don't, I think our authority with our kids had been so undermined. Mm-hmm. Therapists were actively telling parents that they, you know, it could cause them trauma if they weren't connected to their peers 
No parents have ever believed that. Yes. Okay. We were absolutely afraid that it would traumatize our child, that they would make them even more depressed if they were away from their, from other kids for any spate of time. No parent who has ever grounded a child, we call it grounding in the US, I don't know what you call it, but you know, said you can't go out with your friends, has ever ter- been worried that they would emotionally traumatize their children by doing so, not until this generation. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm talking about. You need authority to set, step in when you think your child is being exposed to something harmful or doing something harmful. You need authority. You need to be the authority in your home with your kids in order yeah. to do those things. Brilliant. And that, so that's, and the, I think the second half of the book, when you really push it in that direction is so, so helpful. And it's very different to any of the other takes, I think. And I particularly like the fact that you don't even really mention social media and tech until much further on the book as well. And I, I think that's, again, that's really helpful because often we short circuit the conversation by saying, well, it must be social media. It must be smartphones. And you, you, I think, see that these are longer standing trends that we're dealing with here. Yes. And I ask in the book, what's wrong with smartphones, right? What is wrong with social media? And I make the argument that it's the same thing that bad therapy does. It's causing children to ruminate and young people to ruminate on their pain, on the boy who didn't, the party they weren't invited to, the 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 ways they don't measure up to their peers. It's encouraging the same bad habits. And the problem is those bad habits, right? And we need to get them more in person. But you can't do that. We have to build them a healthier life. And a healthier life includes independence, but it also includes parental authority and it includes in-person uh, relationships that aren't being surveilled by mom. Mm-hmm. Real love relationships, not that that with mom running interference, let them have the relationships with their cousins, with their peers. They will survive it. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail, so much. And unlike lots of the other podcasts, we don't have adverts for um, mental health apps <laughs> on ours. It's, it's notable, even the alternative uh, media, <laughs> they're all advertising uh, uh, mental health apps, right. albeit for right. adults. So, uh, well, I just really recommend that people um, get uh, Abigail's new book. And if you haven't read you. the uh, first book uh, already, then do get those. You'll find them really easily. Um, I think Esther's put the links in the in the chat. If you miss those, just go and obviously go to a good bookseller and and buy the book and read them. They're, they're really fantastic uh, and really very, very readable with just packed full of, of evidence and, uh, and, uh, and anecdotes as well, but really backed up with the evidence. So it's a fantastic set of arguments that you're putting forward, Abigail that are really important so thank you very very much for giving your time so generously and thank you uh, thank you to the crazy 62 questions that we've had in the <laughs> q a box i'll save them and go back through them but um i hope i did them justice without being able to get to every single one um, i'm sure you did I, it was a real pleasure thank you so much thanks so much